Parliament reconvened this week. A main topic of discussion, the Conservative government's jobs grant program. And joining us now to discuss that program, the players and Canada's road to economic recovery, here are Matthew Mendelson, director of the public policy think tank, the Mowat Centre. Mike Moffat, assistant professor of business, economics and public policy at the Ivy School of Business at Western University in London. And Matthew Pearson, provincial affairs reporter for the Ottawa Citizen. And it's good to have all you guys back here in the studio. Let's, uh, I know everybody's seen this because you all watch the hockey playoffs and it was blanketed throughout the hockey playoffs. But once more with feeling, what the heck. Here comes the commercial. Roll tape, please. I've been working hard for the past few weeks trying to find a new job. But I don't have the right skills for the jobs available. How can I get more training? With the new Canada Job Grant, the Government of Canada will partner with businesses, provinces and territories to help Canadians get the right skills for available jobs. The Canada Job Grant will result in one important thing, a new or better job. Visit actionplan.gc.ca slash skills. A message from the Government of Canada. Anything wrong with that ad? <laughs> Well, it's obviously advertising a program that doesn't exist. And, Besides that. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that is obviously not a good use of taxpayer money. Uh, governments are allowed to advertise. Uh, governments are allowed to advertise to uh, convey important information uh, to the public, can advertise services, go to this website and fill out your tax forms in this way. But this obviously uh, was wrong and a mistake, and the uh, Advertising Council has said so. Uh, the Conservatives have kind of acknowledged that and, and pulled... Uh, this ad. When I was in the Ontario government, uh, we passed legislation banning partisan advertising. We so just explain. You you were a member of the civil service. You I was, were, correct. Not a, not a partisan. Not a partisan. I was a, I was a public servant, and uh, we passed legislation uh, that banned partisan advertising. Um, and so every ad we did had to be submitted to the auditor general, um, and it had to be conveying real public information that was important for citizens to understand. Uh, and there were lots of ads that people wanted to run that the auditor general said, no, you can't do it. So I think. I think something like that is necessary in, in Ottawa because this clearly is an ad um, that should not have been run and is a waste of taxpayer Matthew, money. Other Matthew, did this ad have important public information that was useful to the people of Canada? I don't think it was that useful. I mean, uh, Matthew's hit on a good point. They spent $2.5 million on these ads, we know. Um, and it, it, what I think it does actually that's, that is distracting is that it says that the, the money will come also from provinces and territories. And the, the federal government sort of uh, jumped the shark on that one, if you will, they, uh, because there is no, no deal yet with the provinces and territories, so they haven't signed on. So in fact, there isn't going to be money necessarily coming from the provinces and territories for the program, if it gets up and running. Michael, could you talk to us about that? Because it, clearly, they ran these ads assuming the program was in place and that the provinces were on side. Why are the provinces not on side? Well, mostly because the provinces would have to finance this thing. So it was a nice sort of piece of policy where the, the federal government could announce something and stick the provinces with the bill. Uh, naturally, that wasn't very attractive to the provinces. So they said, well, yeah, we, we know you've already advertised this stuff, but uh, we don't really want any part of this. Um, if we're going to do something here, we're going to need a much better deal. And that hasn't come around the corner yet as far as they can see it. As far as they can see it, no. Uh, now, any sort of provincial negotiation where you're negotiating with 10 different provinces, all that have different needs, it's a bit like herding cats. Uh, you know, and that would be sort of a best case scenario when you, when you have a plan that everybody wants. Most of the provinces don't want to touch this if they want to finance it. Plus, you have to get 10, 10 of these guys together. It's a very difficult thing to pull off. The Ontario government, I'm trying to remember how many years ago now, probably four or five years ago, brought in its own kind of retraining program. Uh, you did a big takeout on it, actually. You were here in the studio. Yes. It was one of Dwight, a centerpiece of one of Dwight Duncan's budgets, uh, Second Career, which I guess is meant to be a bit of a mirror to this federal program. Uh, how successful has that been in the interim? Well, it's interesting. Before I answer your question, I'll say that Second Career is actually one of the programs that the Ontario government says stands to be at risk because the federal government wants to take its money that it gives to the provinces through the labor market agreements and re repurpose it for the Canada job grant. So second career, other literacy and basic skills programs would all be at risk if this went forward. Hmm. Um, your question about second career, uh, it was designed at the height of the recession to ch retrain workers who were laid off from mostly manufacturing jobs. Uh, we know that, uh, according to the government, as of December 31st, they've put about 74,000 people through that program. 
But of course, what you're uh, uh, suggesting in some of my earlier reporting is that the program was really good if you were at the top of the waves, if you had high literacy skills, if you were re-employable, re if you were easily trained. But if you didn't have some of those things, it was going to be very hard for you to get the money and get through the system. I guess one of the things we obviously want to explore here is not just how jobs are created in an economy, but whether retraining programs, which every politician everywhere in the world swears by nowadays as the key to getting people back in the workforce, whether they really work. What does your experience tell you about whether these kinds of retraining programs really work to get people back into the workforce? Well, there are lots of different issues here, and some work and some don't. Uh, I think you have to measure them, and you pilot programs, and you test them, and you see which ones are working. But the problem with the Canada Job Grant, I mean, other than it doesn't exist, and there's no <laughs> plan, and we don't know how it would work, uh, and it's trying to take money from provinces. You say all um, that like it's a negative thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, so every now and then people say, well, what's wrong with the Canada Job Grant plan? And I say, well, show me the plan, and then I will tell you which of the various problems are actually likely to manifest. Um, the Canada Job Grant is uh, intended to get employers more involved in training. That is a good thing. We need employers more involved in training. Uh, the Canadian private sector employers underinvest in uh, training compared to our competitors. And so, you know, profitable companies, big companies with uh, fat balance sheets should be investing in training uh, on their own because they need skilled workers. And those kinds of on-the-job training uh, programs do work. Uh, but um, they are usually to provide people with a little bit more skills, you know, learn how to use our operating system. You have basic literacy, numeracy, computer skills. Uh, you have certain kinds of training, and now we have to spend a few weeks, a couple of months with you, making sure you know how uh, it works for us in this company. So that can be effective. That can be very, very effective. The, the problem, you know, part of the backstory to the Canada Job Grant is, you know, the federal government wants to cut uh, the transfers to provinces for the labor market agreements. And as Matthew was saying, a lot of those programs are for you know, basic numeracy, basic literacy, you know, uh, a kid of 20 year olds who've uh, been on the street or have had addiction issues. I mean, so these are hard to serve clienteles. And you know, a month uh, in a big company getting on the job training isn't what they need. What they need are, you know, they have to learn how to use a computer because they've never learned that. And so those are the kinds of programs that the federal government is going gonna, is gonna to cut. And those jobs, that training doesn't lead to a job necessarily tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but it does provide the foundation. From my perspective, employers, with a little bit of encouragement from government, have to do training on the job. Um, and that's not a bad thing. But it's still government's job and you know the provincial government's job to provide the kind of programs currently funded by the labor market agreement to help people who have almost no attachment to the labor market, get attached to the labor market and learn the foundation, which will allow them to find jobs. From your perch at Ivy, based on the analysis you have done, what would you say about the efficacy of retraining programs? I, I think they can work as well. So the devil is in the details. Um, there are a variety of different programs, some that work better than others. Uh, so we have job search type programs. The, the idea is that you become quickly unemployed, uh, we can get you out to the labor force, uh, you know, give you some skills, help you polish up your resume and CVs. Those tend to work very, very well. Job retraining programs are a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, I think what you need in those is real focus of looking at, okay, what are we trying to accomplish from this? You know, what is the timeline? The worry with some of these programs is that if you have somebody in a program that's 18 months, 24 months, then they get out of the labor force for a long time, it's hard for them to, to get back in. So these shorter programs and ones that you can exit, you know, so say you're three months through a program and somebody wants to hire you, you can exit from it. They tend to work a little bit better than the sort of long drawn out uh, type program. Philosophically, do you have an issue with Government of Canada, Government of Ontario, regardless, giving public dollars to private companies to train or retrain that company's own workers. It's a, it's a difficult issue because ideally you want uh, companies to pay for their own workers. The, the problem with that 
Um, if I'm, you know, company X, I train a worker and that costs me ten, fifteen thousand dollars there's nothing uh, preventing, say, Mendelssohn's company from poaching that worker away from me. So you need to have some sort of mechanism to allow for that. So in professional sports, for instance, you know, you, you draft a kid, you have him for six years, you pay for his development, and then the last few years of his contract, he pays off. We don't do that in the rest of our economy. We can't kind of put, put people into indentured servitude. So we need to have some other mechanism for which that uh, we can hire these people, give them the skills, and not, not worry about uh, some competitor poaching them away. Can you talk about that kind of mechanism? Because it, it, it does make sense that you don't want to spend 10 grand retraining somebody who's then going to walk across the street and go work for your competitor. I mean, I think Mike is right, and there's a balanced approach here. We don't want to give windfall you know, uh, uh, windfall profits to profitable companies to train uh, workers. Um, at the same time, we do want to recognize as a public, as a public good, a, a well-trained workforce is a public good. So, you know, we've suggested tax credits um, that uh, companies could have for uh, their skills training programs. So they have to make some investment, but they get some of it recouped in case some of their workers uh, leave. Um, and so you're recognizing the public good, but you're also recognizing employers also have a responsibility uh, to train their workforce. But there are things like, uh, you know, Mike's free agency sports analogy to, to push that further. I mean, in some uh, countries, Germany, for example, uses something called contract clauses so that uh, we will train you um, as our worker, um, but if you leave after a certain period of time, um, you'll have to repay us uh, for that training, which mm. seems reasonable. And some people would be familiar with this. You know, they may take a leave of absence from their work, and their work may pay for an MBA, for example, but they have to come back. And if they don't come back, they're on the hook for the money. Right. And that's kind of a reasonable compromise uh, to make. So there are mechanisms that we can explore, um, which will encourage employers uh, to engage in more training, but also uh, recognize that there are some risks uh, that, that employees may leave. Where would you be on this, Matthew? Well, I, I mean, I agree. I think picking up on one of Matthew's points, we've talked about large companies, but one of the problems that people raise about the Canada Job Grant is that smaller and medium-sized businesses just don't have the human resources or the capacity to provide some type of meaningful training program. So they might not even be able to, even if they had the $5,000, what what incentive is there for them to invest if they have no actual capacity? Um, I also think it's really interesting what companies are doing where they're starting their own in-house apprenticeship programs. There's a company in Ottawa called Abbott Point of Care. I wrote about them this fall, and they design small cartridges for handheld medical devices. And they have basically built a college campus inside their factory where they, they sign up employees and they put them through a three-year apprenticeship program. They backfill those employees' positions. And then when those employees are finished that, they have a new skill that they then take into the workforce. And they, in that facility, maybe get promotions. And Does the taxpayer subsidize any of that? I think that there is some funding through the Ministry of uh, training, college, training Colleges and Universities, but I think the majority is the company's own investment. And when I asked them about that and I asked them, are you worried that people are going to leave, they said, well, it, it happens so rarely because these people see that we're investing in them, we're trying to make them better employees so that they can then um, advocate for themselves and get higher jobs within the company. Let's show you a couple of charts. Uh, look at the monitors here in the studio, everybody, because here's the, here's the unemployment picture that uh, politicians everywhere are trying to do something about. The red line is the province of Ontario. The blue line is uh, the country as a whole. We see where the Great Recession really kicked in in 2009 and the big spike in unemployment there gradually coming down over the intervening four years or so. But the province of Ontario's unemployment rate clearly worse off than the country as a whole. And how about Ontario compared to other provinces? Well, we're sort of right there in the middle, uh, a little higher than some, uh, a lot lower uh, than others. Uh, that's the picture. For those who are old enough to remember when Ontario was the economic engine of the entire country, uh, seeing some provinces like British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba having a lower unemployment rate significantly than the province of Ontario will be somewhat disquieting. Why do, I think you touched on it a moment ago, why do Canadian companies appear to spend so much less retraining workers than all of our competitors? Again, Americans average is two and a quarter percent, we're down at two percent. I mean, that adds up after a while, doesn't it? Oh, well, year after year, it's not just training, uh, the private sector, I mean, and this picks up the point we were talking about earlier, government has a role. 
Uh, but the private sector has a role, and when you look at profitable large companies, you know, RBC or TD, if they need better trained workers, they should train their workers, and I think they do, and they make real investments uh, in their human capital. But it's not just training. Uh, our uh, companies have underinvested in training, they've underinvested in information communication technology, particularly software, um, they've underinvested in machinery and equipment. Um, so all of these things add up over time, and if um, uh, I think part of the reason we have underinvested is in the manufacturing sector, in particular in Ontario, there has been a complacency, um, and we have been as productive and as innovative as we needed to be, uh, and that is, you know, uh, uh, something I, I've, you know, we're, we're going to do a publication. We say that we've, we've, we, we understood what the model was. We had a cheap dollar. Um, our labor costs were lower compared to the United States. We were really close. It was easy to export. They wanted to buy our stuff, and that was and, and businesses succeeded and were profitable and paid decent wages to their employees. But the world has changed, um, and regardless of what happens with the dollar in the next year or two, we're not going back to a dollar of seventy or seventy-five cents. Uh, we have new competitors in Asia and Latin America, and so now, in order for Canadian companies. Uh, particularly in the manufacturing sector, but also service, to be competitive, to be productive, they have to make more investments in all of these things. And they can't be complacent anymore. Michael, are there cultural reasons why Canadians would be less interested in doing this than Americans are? I, I think it is actually sociological. There was uh, Don Drummond had a report a couple of years ago, uh, it was something like Confessions of a Serial Productivity Researcher. <laughs> and his uh, basic him. point was, We've tried everything uh, that makes sense economically and nothing's worked. And I su suspect it is sociological because if you go down the chain, we underinvest in everything. We underinvest in people, equipment, software, down the line. And I think what drives a lot of that is risk aversion. So some of it is complacency. Uh, but our business culture, and I hope Ivy isn't contributing to that, I like to think we're not, is very, very risk averse. Because anytime you make an investment, you could end up losing. That, you know, I invest a bunch of money um, and this person leaves. Or I invest a bunch of money in some new software system and it doesn't make us more productive. So I think part of the problem is we just, we need to find a way to be a little more risky and to take, take on more challenges than, than we are. On the other hand, other Matthew, mm. during the Great Recession, when our bankers were much less risk averse than America's bankers, uh, didn't act like a bunch of cowboys, our economy didn't almost go over a cliff like the American economy did. There's, there's, there's good reason sometimes to be less risk averse, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think that, uh, and it was also that it was during that time that the government stepped in and tried to create a program like Second Career. And it did actually do some good. It put some people back into retraining. It got them new jobs, but it didn't help all of those people. So let's ask the bigger question here then of what, given the different perspectives you all bring to this and the different experiences that you've watched along the way, what you think the role of government ought to be in the creation of a job. Okay? Let's start. What role does the government have in order to get jobs? Because we saw the numbers. We know that governments want to get unemployment rates down. Whether they're prepared to do absolutely everything to get that done is another question. What's their role in getting the unemployment rate down? Well, I think their role is, is more economic environment, so they shouldn't be out there. They can't directly create jobs unless they're going to be physically hiring people uh, themselves, but it's creating the economic environment. So, for instance, in London, Ontario, there was a, a manufacturing company that we already have, wanted to open a new plant on the, out, on the outskirts of the city. Um, they set it up, they bought the land, everything was, was going okay, you know, the, the mayor and council were very excited about this. Then all of a sudden, the city realized that they couldn't get water to the facility. They said, okay, well, we have to put in a new pumping station. This costs $6 million. Here's your bill. Those are the kind of things that, that we need to avoid, that we need to be sort of upfront, figure out what we need as far as infrastructure goes, and, and get the basic things right. Unfortunately, it's not very sexy. It's not very sexy to say, well, make sure that roads and hydro are hooked up on time. Make sure the water gets out there. 
but when I talk to business people, that's what they complain about most uh, is just basic services not being function, you know, not basically not happening. So those are the things we need to concentrate on. But unfortunately, they're, they're not all that interesting. You're never going to get a headline in the Globe and Mail saying, you know, factory got their water hooked up. But <laughs> really, that, that's what drives a lot of economic activity. And unfortunately for us in London, that plant ended up moving to St. Thomas uh, simply because they couldn't get the services they needed. Matthew, how were jobs created? I, I, if, I, if I knew, I would try to trademark it. Uh, I was going to say that it actually comes back to um, going even further back to training and to um, in the education system, in schooling it through JK to uh, grade 12 and also the college and university system that is preparing students and young people to go out into the workforce with the skills that they need. Um, one thing that was interesting, uh, picking up on something the other Matthew said, uh, is this, the businesses need to wrap their head around this notion that they're so used to governments training workers and businesses employing them and now that model is sort of changing where governments don't necessarily train all the workers and businesses are having to do it. But I think that uh, you know if, if college and university programs were actually um, leaving, uh, instilling the skills that students need to get these kind of jobs that are out there, particularly if the economy in Ontario is going to head toward more um, uh, high-level uh, manufacturing, those are jobs that people need good training for. Government's job and job creation? So there are lots of things that governments can't control. The world is a big place, Ontario is a small place. Uh, there are lots of forces out there that are going to impact job creation, the unemployment rate. We have to be realistic about what governments can and can't do. And there is certainly a view out there that what governments can do is create the environment. You know, well-trained workforce, uh, reasonable taxes, but good quality of life and find uh, the balance there. And that's obviously important. Uh, government can't go out and create uh, millions of jobs, but there are other things that you they can there. do. Really? Government cannot go out and create jobs? Uh, I said millions of jobs. Um, I mean, governments can hire. So here's, here's how they can create jobs, I believe. You invest in things that are really important to your long-term uh, prosperity. So uh, government can create jobs by investing in infrastructure. So we could make a really big decision to reinvest and renew our aging infrastructure in Ontario, for example. That would require long-term debt, but it would likely pay off in better productivity, better jobs over time, but of course it would also provide uh, jobs in the short term. We can really invest in things like science and technology and research that provide immediate short-term jobs but likely uh, create prosperity uh, over time. Government does have a really important uh, job in making big strategic choices uh, and they can't, I don't think, or shouldn't, you know, pick specific companies but they can pick sectors and uh, have strategic objectives. I mean, uh, one of the most successful sectors in Canada right now is the oil sector and the oil sands. Billions and billions of dollars. I remember, you probably do as well, Steve, uh, documentaries when I was in elementary school at the NFB about all of the riches trapped underneath the, uh, the sands that unfortunately we could never unlock. But governments decided, and Alberta government, but also the federal government said, we're going to invest in research around unconventional technology, unconventional oil, try and capture some of that wealth. And that is a government decision to make uh, you know, a strategic play. And it may not have worked. I mean, Mike said there's risk. I mean, like in, in Ontario with, uh, uh, in 2008, 2009, with the car companies. I mean, the Ontario government and federal government stepped and said, we're saving these jobs. We're going to make a huge investment in Chrysler and GM. We're going to bail them out. Everyone criticized. Almost all of that money now has been paid off. Um, it al costs almost nothing right now for the Ontario and federal government taxpayer. But they made a strategic choice that the auto sector was so crucial to the southwestern economy, not just for the people who are employed there, but all of the other people who have jobs relying on uh, that sector. We're going to you know, save these jobs, create these jobs. That's part of government's job, to make strategic choices about where they're going to put their okay, resources. But let me follow up with Mike here, because I take your point that the government made a decision to step in and save those jobs. They didn't create those jobs in the first place. They saved private sector jobs. There are a million people in this province. You're one of them. I'm one of them. Who get a paycheck because the government funds what we do. Absolutely. Not totally, but mostly. Yeah. Did the government create our jobs? 
Um, in, in a sense, yes. I, unfortunately, I, I, there's only so far, we, we can't all work for the government at the end of the day. So there are, there's only sort of a proportion of, of people that can work for the government. But, you know, if, if the government decides that, uh, you know, we want more early childhood education, we're going to hire more early childhood educators, I, I think that would be a fantastic thing. Would, again, create jobs because you'd be hiring these people. But that's not going to that's not going to get you say Tim Hudak's million jobs just by uh, hiring some <laughs> kindergarten teachers. We're going to come back to that. We, we are going to come back to Mr. Hudak's million uh, million job bid. Cisco. I want to talk about this Cisco deal because this is a clear example of where the government has decided to come in and help subsidize a perfectly profitable private company. They would argue in order that the jobs that this deal will help support stay here get created here as opposed to getting created somewhere else. What do you think of the argument? Well, I mean, we know that the money that the government is giving to Cisco, $190 million over uh, in the first six years, I believe, and then I think it's 40, uh, $30 million for the up to 10 years, so $220 million over, over a decade. Yeah. Um, and the company hopes to create 3,700 jobs. Um, I think if you take the first 190 million and the 1,700 jobs they'll create, it's about 111,000 per job, some would say, that they're basically paying for those jobs. Uh, I think what's interesting about it is that we don't know whether or not the company would have done some of those things on their own. But what we hear and what the government tells us is that, you know, this is, that they are sort of locked in, in a fight against other jurisdictions who are competing for these jobs. And so if we don't do something, these jobs, will, like these companies, will look for the best deal elsewhere. And so maybe it's in Mexico, maybe it's in the state of Delaware, who knows where it is. But that, you know, these companies have a lot to offer, and they're high-paying jobs, and they're attractive jobs. And so the government, if they are serious about creating jobs in Ontario, keeping jobs in Ontario, then they have to pony up. If we say to companies, come here, we'll help subsidize the job creation, we'll give you $100,000 per job, is that still, in terms of the benefit to the entire economy, worth doing? It can be. Uh, the devil's in the details. So I think if you had a case where you had a bunch of people who were structurally unemployed, say, uh, say Heinz workers in Leamington, Ontario, where a lot of them weren't going to get a job right away, if at all, then I think there could be a role for government to come in and say, okay, we've got this plant, we're going to put it in Leamington, we're going to help subsidize these people because the money that will save on EI and, and welfare and that sort of thing. Here, I, I really dislike the Cisco deal. I, I think that's well known at this point. <laughs> uh, be, because I don't really see any new job creation. That Basically, what we're doing is we're subsidizing an American firm uh, to poach workers away from indigenous Canadian firms like Shopify. Uh, and they're really ironic. Well, well, hang on, they would, they would dispute that. They would say, we're also going to provide opportunities for people coming right out of college and universities. And Who would have otherwise been hired by places like, like Shopify. Maybe, they, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not, but the unemployment rate in the sector is about 2%. We're not, if we had a case, I would agree that if we had a case that people are coming out of college with these degrees, can't get a job, I think that's a different story. But the really ironic thing about this is if we had done this for a Canadian firm, so we said, okay, BlackBerry, we're going to do this, the Americans would come at us so hard under NAFTA. So we can't subsidize our own firms, but all of a sudden we can subsidize the Americans. It's a very, very strange approach, and I'm not a fan of it. What's your view on, on that method to create jobs? Because these would be new jobs. What's your view on subsidizing profitable companies to create these new jobs? So I, uh, I haven't seen the Cisco deal, so I'm not going to comment on the Cisco deal uh, as such. Uh, I think that in general, one should not be um, uh, subsidizing a great deal, uh, uh, profitable companies, and you know, picking uh, one company over another. Uh, I do think, though, um, that there are lots of instances now where uh, uh, Profitable multinational corporations um, come and say we're looking to set up a plant or set up a research site um, and come to the table and help us. 
And sometimes that's a little bit of money, but sometimes it's connecting the water pump. Um, sometimes it's you know moving through some uh, some challenges with local zoning and saying, okay, we'll get you in here more quickly because we'll speed up the process. Usually it takes you a year to get the permit. There are all kinds of things that governments can do. One of them is coming to the table with money. Americans do it way more than we do. A lot of countries do it way more than we do. And so I do think it is a, a legitimate point to say maybe we have to be competing a little bit more uh, on that. But I don't think we should be doing it in situations where you are creating a beggar thy neighbor uh, approach where uh, you're choosing one over another and it actually has real problems uh, for other companies. I mean, the Leamington case is a really interesting one where you have a Heinz uh, plant closed in a community that's very reliant on food processing and agriculture agriculture um, and the the plant was real is really crucial to the local economy and there I know that you know the government is having conversations with other people in the private sector and saying okay how can we use these resources how can we use these people how can we use this plant and so government kind of comes in and uses its moral authority to say you know we want to help this community can we find another private sector investor who needs this plant and if we need to upgrade it a little bit and we need to write a little bit uh, some checks the the costs are going to be way offset by the savings in social assistance or other things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate role for government. Do you know that they're doing that in this case with Leamington? I would imagine, I would imagine they are. Okay. Let's talk about Tim Hudak's plan. It is not normal, I think, to see a provincial opposition leader on the front page of Canada's national newspaper in color above the fold. And yet, a couple of weeks ago, that's exactly where Tim Hudak found himself, above the fold, color picture, Globe and Mail, with his million jobs plan. It is definitely, in terms of sizzle, it's got some currency in the marketplace right now. People are talking about it. It's a snappy title, the million jobs bill. Question, of course, is, will it work? Mike. Well, he's really betting on a lot of factors that are outside of his control. Because if you look at uh, historically when southwestern Ontario, or Ontario in general, has created a bunch of jobs or employment's gone up, we've actually done the million jobs over eight years before. That, ha that happened in the late 90s, early 2000s. But what did we have going on in the late 90s, 2000s? We had a very strong export market to the U.S. We had the Canadian dollar at one point down to 68 cents. Uh, we had oil prices at about 25 to 30 dollars a barrel, which is important because a lot of these manufacturing companies use oil. So we had a perfect storm of factors. Perfect storm of good things. Oh, good things. That, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess storm so is. The low dollar is a good thing. <laughs> well, it, it, it is. Uh, it is if you're a southwestern Ontario export firm. Right. Um, not so good for consumers. But anyhow. Uh, Hudak doesn't really control any of those things. Uh, you know, he can't control any of those factors. So he's really making a bet on how the economy is going to do. But that being said, that bet's not going to pay. Or, you know, we're not going to know how that bet turns off for eight years. He's got the Globe and Mail headlines uh, this, this week. So I, I think a lot of politicians are going to be paying attention and saying, you know what, that, this might not be a bad approach. Well, that's why I was saying the sizzle is great, because he's got attention for an idea, which if you're in opposition is what you want to do. But many of the things on the list to get you to a million jobs are, frankly, outside his control. Free trade, for example, with the provinces. And that's something he can't do on his own. So how realistic is it that the million jobs after eight years, once he becomes premier, if he becomes premier, will happen? Well, for the record, I should say that we put the story below the fold. Uh, <laughs> I know we're not the national newspaper, but that's where it was. Um, well, you know, I've asked Hudak about this several times, and he'll say, you know, he thinks it's uh, ambitious but doable. And uh, he does talk about, you know, the Tories have for a while have been releasing these white papers, and this Jobs Act sort of brings a bunch of them together. So lower corporate taxes, lower energy rates, uh, less red tape, um, uh, more free trade, as you've already named, and I think the Flexible labor markets. Yeah, yeah. although there's no yeah. mention of right to work in, in this bill. Right. But uh, so he, he does think that it's doable if, if we take these steps. I think one thing that he also says is that uh, part of the effort is just to make Ontario a more competitive place. So if there are jobs out there, that those employers bring those jobs to Ontario. And what I think I've heard them say is that they don't think that Ontario is very competitive right now. And so that's, that it's sort of like making the place more. So if the like pie becomes larger, then, then there will be more jobs. I've also heard them say, you know, uh, you know, a million jobs is their goal. But I think just them 
having a goal suggests to voters that this is a party who is serious about job creation and they've sort of staked a line and has a plan at a million jobs yeah. yeah should we take 20 seconds because we're both really nerdy on this to explain why these are actually not white papers even though the Tories call them white papers all yours <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, governments I mean, in, issue white papers. I, I mean, in in uh, usually the government. in the 50s and 60s, yeah. they would uh, release uh, white papers and green papers, and uh, those were symbols of how um, mature the policy thinking was. And I actually think, as a Democrat, as someone who believes in public participation in the policy small process, d. Yes. small d. Um, <laughs> Uh, that we should do more of these. And so uh, I think government should uh, say, okay, here's some ideas we're considering. Let's uh, talk about them, issue them in a white paper, then a green paper, which is kind of more flushed but, fleshed okay, out. It, but government doesn't do that anymore. Government does a you press guys do release. It now. And um, Moat Center does that. Yeah. We, we, you should consider all of our papers as, as white papers. <laughs> well, but no, they're discussion papers. They they're not white papers because you're not the government. That, that is true. Anyway, the, the conditions upon which those million jobs would be created if the Million Jobs Act passes, does that have any connection to reality in your view? So, uh, I, I mean, as Mike said, uh, and uh, as the other Matthew said, <laughs> he's the other Matthew, um, the, uh, I mean, it requires a lot of things to go well, and I think it's more symbolic than real. I mean, I don't think on, on day eight, um, uh, uh, year eight, they expect like exactly one million jobs to be hit. It's not like the Jerry Lewis telethon where uh, on, in year eight they're going to try to get to the million. It's a symbolic thing. It says, here's our agenda. We think it will create a lot of jobs. Okay, but starting and, then, and then people can have a discussion about that agenda. I mean, uh, lower corporate taxes. I mean, you can go through the list of their agenda. But that's what I was going to say, Matthew. Yeah. We, we've, we have seen for the last several years the current liberal government of Ontario has consistently cut corporate tax rates during the 10 years it's been in power. Well, not during the first few years, but eventually they got around to it. It has not resulted in a significant, or maybe any uptick in job creation in the province at all. So, I think on the tax environment, I mean, Ontario has a very competitive tax environment right now. Hasn't resulted um, in jobs, though. And it has not resulted in jobs. When you look at down the list of what the Ontario corporate sector has said they needed. They wanted uh, cuts in corporate taxes. They Which got, they got. They wanted uh, cuts um, in the capital tax, the elimination of the capital tax. Which tax they got. on their uh, capital sort of sitting in the bank. They got that eliminated. They wanted a harmonization um, uh, of the sales tax and elimination of the PST, the provincial sales tax. Which they got. They got that. So they got a very competitive uh, tax environment um, and they have not been, I mean, some companies have been, some sectors have been, I mean, the financial services, health research, I mean, there are lots of sectors that you could go through. But mostly as the finance well. minister and the governor of the Bank of Canada said, they've been sitting on a lot of dead money. They, ha they have a lot of very profitable large companies have have very flush balance sheets. And yes, I do believe they should be uh, investing more in training their workers, uh, information communication technology, all of the stuff uh, we've been talking about. And I don't think a more competitive tax environment um, will create lots more jobs. There are other things uh, that might do it, but I think the reality, as you have said, Steve, is the private sector got a lot of what they've been asking for on the tax environment. Um, and now maybe it's time for them to step up. Hmm. We got about a minute and a half here. Mike, let me give it to you. After it's all said and done, a lot of the public looks to government to quote unquote create jobs. Have we concluded today that they really kind of can't? Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think it's unfortunate that governments get uh, far too much credit when things are going well and uh, not nearly enough credit when, when things are going badly. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that you can really do to help employment are very, very long term. I think one of the best things that you could do is invest in early childhood education for children at risk. Well, okay, that helps whoever's premier 25 years from now. Right. So there isn't a lot you can do, but that being said, we all, you, you take a poll, everybody cares about jobs in the economy. It's point one. So naturally, uh, politicians feel that they have to do something there when really a lot of this is out of their control. Gotcha. Gentlemen, thanks for this conversation tonight. We didn't solve the unemployment crisis, but I didn't think we would. But we had a good chat about it. Matthew Mendelson, director of the Mowat Center. Mike Moffat from the Ivy Business School at Western University. Matthew Pearson, provincial affairs reporter for the Ottawa Citizen. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.